In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to our study through the book of 2 Samuel. And today we arrive at 2 Samuel chapter 7, one of the most important chapters in the entire Old Testament, because it talks about the dynastic promise. This is a promise that is echoed throughout the prophetic literature, and it reaches fulfillment in the New Testament with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament authors, they, they put a lot of emphasis on this promise. They refer to it numerous times. And once you know 2 Samuel, you can read the prophets, you can read the New Testament, and you'll be able to see where they're referring to the dynastic promise. Now, what is the dynastic promise? It's the promise of an eternal dynasty. God promised David that he would have an eternal dynasty. One of the two great promises in the Old Testament, the promise made to Abraham that through Abraham's descendant, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the promise made to David that he would always have a throne, an eternal throne for all of eternity. And of course, the one who occupies that throne is the Christ, the Messiah. So let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and walk through the dynastic promise. There's so much to break down in this chapter. So we go to the biblical text. If you go to, go to 2 Samuel 7 in your Bible, I'm using the RSVCE edition. And it says that now when the king dwelt in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies round about. This is actually the fulfillment of a prophecy in the book of Deuteronomy that God would give Israel rest from all their enemies around them. It says that the king said to Nathan the prophet, see, I, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, this actually goes back to chapter 5. If you remember chapter 5 and chapter 6, David, he conquered Jerusalem, and the king of Tyre, Hiram, he sent him cedars so that David could build this beautiful house of cedar. Termites don't like cedar. And so David is living in this palace and he's looking at the ark dwelling in a tent. And you can really see the beauty of, of what David is doing. He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about God. And he's asking, why do I have so much when I'm not giving more to the Lord? And this is really a basic question that all of us can ask ourselves. You know, why do I dwell in a house of cedar while the ark of God dwells in a tent? How much am I giving to myself? How much am I doing for myself? And what am I doing to really glorify the Lord and recognize that he's king of the universe? So David is thinking, something's wrong here. I'm the king of Israel, but it's really God's kingship. And that's a beauty about, you know, David's ministry. He recognizes the Lord's eternal kingship. And so in verse 4, it says, That same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Nathan the prophet. Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? Now, a, a lot of these verses are very profound. Nobody can build a house for God to dwell in. Actually, when Solomon dedicates the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, you know, he basically says, you know, how can I build a house for you? You dwell in the highest of heavens. The highest of heavens can't even contain you, Lord. So who am I to build a house for you? And there's something beautiful here that really provides the background for Jesus's conversation with this Samaritan woman when he talks about true worshipers who will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. This is all providing background for that great conversation. So it says in chapter 7, verse 6, it says, I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. That's the tabernacle. And in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges or Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David. Now, notice how the Lord calls David, my servant David. This is very important because the same phrase will echo in prophetic literature. Hosea 3, 5, Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 37, 
And also in, where's the fourth place that we find my servant David? I'm trying to remember it. Hosea 3, 5, Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37. I think it's also in Jeremiah 39 as well. So that special phrase, God calls David, my servant David. Very important phrase. When Jesus comes, he says that, he says, I have come not to be served, but to serve, to give my life as a ransom for the many. And so he goes on. And if you, if you go to verse 8, it says, Therefore, thus sh you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. Now, the concept of having a great name is very important here, too, because there's really only two people in the Old Testament who have a great name, David and Abraham. And this really helps us to understand something about David and Abraham. The promises that are tied to David and Abraham, made through David and Abraham, fulfilled in the coming of the Christ, help us to understand why God made a great name for them. Because he made covenants with them that reach fulfillment in the coming of the Christ. And that's all connected to the concept of the great name. And then Jesus, who fulfills those promises, has the name above all all names, according to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. So he says, he says in verse 10, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them. Notice the agricultural imagery. I will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall, shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Notice there's two houses. God's gonna build a house, which is a dynasty. David's son will build a house, which will be the temple. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. I will, literally, I will raise up your seed, Zerah, after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, this is really important here because Solomon's kingdom did not last forever. It only, I mean, it only lasted for, you know, 400 and some years. The word forever here, um, it actually has a very nuanced kind of uh, understanding. And there's various ways of expressing the concept of forever in Hebrew. So the word forever, technically, it could just mean a long period of time. And so sometimes people say, well, it's Solomon, his kingdom, it lasted 480 years, and then after that, it ceased. But Christians will read this and say that, but you know, you really see this fulfilled in Christ, because it's in Christ who reigns for all of eternity, that the house or kingdom or dynasty is truly established forever. And he is a descendant of David. And so verse 14 says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. When he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But I will not take my steadfast love from him. And so this verse definitely refers to Solomon. God chastened Solomon and his sons. The kingdom of Judah eventually was destroyed because of their wickedness, their apostasy, their enemies overran them and took them into exile. But he goes on, he says, but he, but I will not take my steadfast love from him. In other words, the promise being made to David will never be taken away. It will reach fulfillment. And that's very important to understand who Jesus is. And so it goes on, and the word for steadfast love, by the way, it's the word chesed. It's a very special word in Hebrew. If you want more on this concept of steadfast love, look at my video on Psalm 136. Go to the playlist on the Psalms, find the video on Psalm 136, and I go into great detail about this concept of chesed, or steadfast love, merciful love, loving kindness. It's a very difficult word to define in English. So, so let's go through the dynastic promise right now, okay? Let's walk through it a little bit. So first and foremost, the dynastic promise is a promise of an eternal dynasty. 
God is promising that a descendant or seed of David will always sit upon his throne. This affected the prophetic literature like you cannot imagine. And so many of the promises of a future king or messianic promises, scholars debate over exactly how to classify those. But many of these promises of a future king, messianic promises, are recalling this great dynastic promise. So you can, I've got a list of some of these promises right here. There's so many to mention. You could, you know, I'll mention a few of them. Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 11, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, Jeremiah 39, Jeremiah 33, 14 to 15, Ezekiel 34, 22 to 28, Ezekiel 37, 23 to 28. Much, much more could be said. But here's one point that people miss. God promises David, I will build a house for you. So the house that's going to be built by God is the eternal throne. And so he talks about how David will always have a seed on the throne. And the word for seed in Hebrew, it's zerah. You will always have a descendant upon your throne. What's really interesting is there's three great promises about a seed, a Zerah, in the Old Testament. The first is found in Genesis chapter uh, 3.15. And Catholics, we call that the Proto-Evangelium. And what that means is the first gospel. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And otherwise, in other words, implicitly, the seed of the woman will triumph over the devil and those who follow him. And so that's the Proto-Evangelium. And um, the next one is the promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This is translated in various ways because a lot of scholars say that it's a, a singular plural uh, just, like, just like if a farmer said, I'm going to go out and throw seed in the field, he's referring to not just one seed, but a lot of seed. Uh, and so also the way it says, you know, all, through your descendant, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It could also be translated, bless themselves. So it's highly debated. But the bottom line is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. If you go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says, that this promise made to Abraham is best understood in the fullest way as being fulfilled in the Christ, in Jesus our Lord. He's the seed of Abraham through whom all the nations of the earth will inherit eternal blessing. And so finally, the third one is that through the seed of David, David will always have a descendant on his throne, okay? And so you get the idea, the three promises incredible promises. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Through this seed of Abraham, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Through the seed of David, David will always have a descendant upon his throne. They, they all reach fulfillment in Jesus, in the Christ. And so the second house, there's two houses that are spoken of in 2 Samuel. The second house is the temple. Your son is going to build a temple, and that son would be Solomon. And so this is really interesting because Solomon built the temple. Chronicles, the book of the book of Chronicles, it tells us, the chronicler tells us that it was because Solomon didn't have blood on his hands. And so David, because of all the battles and wars that he was in, especially the sin of your you know, adultery and the death of Uriah the Hittite. He had blood on his hands. He was a guilty man uh, in that particular case. Read Psalm 51. And so Solomon would be the one who would build the temple. He personifies a wisdom-filled king. And of course, when you get to the New Testament, this promise of the second house built by Solomon, it, there's also a, a play of, uh, on this because Jesus says, destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days, referring to his body. Uh, referring to the fact that he would be risen in glory. And so this concept of a new spiritual temple in Christ becomes preeminent in the New Testament. And all of us, according to St. Peter, are living stones incorporated into this new spiritual temple in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that amazing? 
And so let's walk through the text. God talks about how David has been given rest from all of his enemies. He's given David rest from all his enemies. This fulfills promises made in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 10 and also Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 25, 19, where Moses talks about how God will give you rest from all your enemies. Joshua 21, 44 sees a partial fulfillment in this after the conquest. And so now that David has rest from all his enemies, God can do something incredible. He's fulfilled this promise. Now he's going to make another promise. David's uh, exclamation, I dwell in a house of cedar while God dwells in a tent. It really underlines his humility. And what Nathan says is so beautiful. Do that which is in your heart. Now, the scriptures tell us not to follow our heart. We see a lot of times when people followed their heart and they made a lot of mistakes. If, if you want examples, go read the book of Judges. I have a whole playlist on Judges and we go through this over and over again. Don't follow your heart. But David has a heart for the Lord. His desire is not to do what his own desire is, but what, what the Lord's desire is. So in this sense, Nathan says, do all that is in your heart, because David's looking at this from a godly perspective. I dwell in a house of cedar, but God's in a house of tent. He's in a tent. You know, I want to give more to the Lord, essentially, is what David is saying. I want to recognize his kingship. So the word of the Lord comes to Nathan uh, that night immediately. And it's really amazing. While David is humbling himself and with this humble attitude and thought that he has, the word of the Lord comes to God's prophet about the dynastic promise. And so what's beautiful about this is the question, you know, would you really build me a house to dwell in? The rhetorical question is revisited when you go to 1 Kings 8, 27 to 30. Solomon essentially reflects on this question as he's conducting the consecration ceremony as a priest king in 1 Kings chapter 8. It's like Solomon is saying, Lord, we've built you a beautiful temple, but let's be honest. Even the highest of, of heavens can't even contain you. So, you know, how can you dwell with us here on earth? And so he's recognizing the limitations of the earthly temple. And so a generation later, Solomon poses the question for, for will God in truth dwell upon earth? And it's underlining how God has chosen to dwell in the midst of his people. And so the question about building the Lord a house. It's a, a primary importance because the Lord has chosen to dwell in the midst of a portable tent during the desert journey. We see that in Exodus 25, 7 through 8. And now the temple will underline how God has chosen to dwell in the midst of his people in Jerusalem. This is very important. And it's important to read 2 Samuel 5, 6, and 7 together to see how this all fits together with the priest king dwelling in the midst of his people in Jerusalem. So the Lord uses the special phrase, my servant David. And this is a phrase that you're going to see over and over again. So when the kingdom of Judah is being destroyed, the Lord says, you know, for the sake of my servant David. You know, he talks about this Davidic promise and how it will remain for the sake of my servant David. And so Ezekiel, when he sees Jerusalem being destroyed, he's in exile, but he prophesies through the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. He, he prophesies at the very end of his book, chapter 34, and also chapter 37, about how the Lord will renew the Davidic dynasty with a king who is called my servant David, a new Davidic king that will be like David. Of course, that's the Christ. He's like David, but he's exceedingly greater than David. And then the, the Lord says he will give David a great name, and that's tied directly to the promise of an eternal throne. And when you get to the Gospel of Matthew, the very first verse underlines that Jesus the Christ is the descendant of Abraham and David, the two figures who were given a great name. And, and those the great name is not for them, it's for God, because God made promises to Abraham and David that are fulfilled in the Christ, in the Messiah. And that's how we understand the great 
name given to Abraham and David. So now we got to understand the importance of Zion, the importance of Jerusalem, because the Lord essentially is, is choosing to dwell in the midst of his people in Zion, in Jerusalem. And so the temple is going to make this concrete and in, in a literally concrete. So David is promised a dynasty. And the unfortunate thing is that most of the kings are not good kings in this dynasty. There's a couple good ones. So you might remember maybe Hezekiah or maybe Josiah, but most of them are not good. They're, they're, they're bad. And that's really what's amazing about this promise is that the Lord keeps it even though many of the kings were bad. So the promise of a future descendant once again recalls the promise made to Abraham. And the Hebrew word for descendant is Zerah, which literally means seed. As I, as I mentioned already, you can look back at Genesis 3.15. You can go back to Genesis 18, uh, 8, 18, 18 and 22, 18 and see the incredible promises that were made to Abraham and also made to Eve and how the promise made to David is very similar. It picks up on this concept of a seed, the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through the seed of Abraham and the Lord will raise up the seed of David and establish his kingdom forever. Look at the concept. It's all referring to a future descendant. The early church recognizes that this future descendant is the Christ, our Lord Jesus. So we're going to uh, jump ahead here. So there's also this special father-son relationship between the Lord and between the king. And we see uh, implications of this in Psalm 2, which talks about the king being the, the Lord's begotten son. Uh, and then also you're going to find this if, if you go to Isaiah chapter 9 as well, where the king is given all these titles in Isaiah 9, and one of them is God Hero. And that's like, what? God Hero? Whoa. And so it, 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 it's tied to this concept of the king being like a beloved son of God. Uh, and so how can we understand this? Possibly the, the concept is that God viewed the king as a adopted son and treated him like a son. Uh, and this is really amazing. You find it also in Psalm 89 verses 20 to 28. So the king is treated like he's an adopted son of God. He's, he's meant to execute God's will, God's justice, God's righteousness through his kingship. So when, when Jeconiah was taken into exile, one of the last kings in Judah, probably the last legitimate king, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, and this discipline, he disciplined his son, was manifested in the fullest sense. So the Lord, we can see how he disciplined these earthly kings, especially because they were not bad, because their, their kingdom was essentially destroyed and they were taken away into exile. So the kingdom of, if you look at the kingdom of David, it lasted something like 480 years, but eventually it was wiped out and they went into exile. And when they came back, there was no king on the throne. They had the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans ruling over them. And so Jesus comes and during his lifetime, there's been 600 years and there's been no visible Davidic king on the throne. And so you can just imagine the news about a son of David who's working miracles, who's the Messiah, and how people would say, this is amazing. We finally have the fulfillment of this promise. So in verse 15, the Lord talks about his loving kindness. This is a very special word in Hebrew, chesed. It's often translated steadfast love, uh, loving kindness, merciful love, favor, loyalty. There's really no one word in English to translate it. So you often see different translations. But this is a very important verse because it underlines that God will not reject this covenant. He will be faithful to this covenant. And if you want a good example of the concept of chesed, just read Psalm 136. You can read it in English and you'll get the idea. Over and over again, it says that God's merciful love, steadfast love, mercy endures forever. So when the Bible was translated from Hebrew into Greek, they, the best word they could choose was the word eleos, which means mercy. 
And so right after receiving this incredible promise, what does David do? He makes an act of thanksgiving. And I really think that this is one of the, the most um, missed uh, portions of you know, the promise. David's act of thanksgiving, in it about 10 times, he tells the Lord that he's the servant of the Lord. And this is very beautiful. We see this, uh, especially when, in Mary's, uh, when Mary uh, is visited by Gabriel, where she calls herself the handmaid of the Lord. And so David, when he receives this promise, he calls himself the servant of the Lord. Basically, he's saying, this isn't about me. This is about God's will, doing the Lord's will. And so that's one of the extraordinary things about the dynastic promise. Read the words that David uses when he gives thanks to the Lord. This is how we should live. So my brothers and sisters, 2 Samuel chapter 7. You're going to hear this a lot as we go through the prophets and also as we go through the New Testament. Remember this chapter in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.